direct us to make this sort of anti-behavioral um, move in linguistics and um, I think you sort of hint at how we might do so in the, the political realm, pointing to examples and the sort of influences that lead to different judgments. Um, and we also point to sort of the similarities we have, you know, genetically, you know, with the studies looking at little babies and stuff and um, perhaps what you would call the combinatorial capacity philosophy might, we, philosophy we might call practical reason or something like that as sort of the basis of our difference and potentially our ability to overcome those differences. But here's, a, here's another question. Um, in a group of adults, all raised in the same country, mostly exposed to the same influences growing up uh, in terms of cultural influences, why is such a divergent set of moral appraisals um, between government elites and people not in government? Um, what's the contribution of that particular institution to this sort of, um, these, that sort of is able to overcome what would normally you would think would be very deep-seated moral intuitions? Me or you? Uh, well, first of all, I don't think we have to look very far. It's true of all of us. I mean, when, uh, I mean, the examples I was giving, I purposely gave to, because they illustrate the educated culture in which we are all Heart, which is not very far from uh, government elites, or in fact, they're right from here, you know. Uh, and uh, many of them, people we know, and uh, and uh, or, um, or or the media. It's all this very. It's a, it's an intellectual, moral culture that we're all part of, like Harvard Square is right at the core of it. So if we think about it, we can answer the question by looking in the mirror. Uh, and I think the answer we find is that uh, when you begin to play an institutional role of some kind, you uh, just you can only do it. There's only one, uh, two approaches you can take. One is to just recognize that the institution is inherently immoral and has to be significantly changed. In which case, you're out. Uh, or else you somehow stay within it, uh, accommodate to it, uh, begin to internalize its values, and no matter how they conflict with your own, and you live these joint lives. Uh, it's true in uh, just about, I mean, I, I, don't know, I think it's hard to find a counterexample. We can find it in our own lives, we find it uh, in governments, we find it in corporations, uh, anywhere we look. You have these, these this is your choice. Will I? resist and try to change the structure of the institution if I recognize in one part of my moral capacities that it's uh, 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 wrong, repressive, uh, murderous, and so on, or will I simply accommodate to it in one fashion or another? And there are a lot of ways to do that. Uh, one of them is to convince yourself almost always falsely uh, that uh, actually you're doing good by doing wrong. Uh, that's why when you look at the history of uh, leadership, you know, articulate leadership, uh, you find that everything they do is noble. It's hard to find an exception. Try to find a historical exception. Uh, even among the worst monsters, you know, Hitler, Stalin, pick your choice, uh, everything they did was noble. And there's very good reason to think that they believed it. Uh, because we see, when you look at documentary records, that uh, they talk to each other the same way they talk in public. Uh, so you kind of internalize it. So yeah, it's moral. So when uh, the Japanese fascists, let's say, were, uh, and there we happen to have extensive records, because defeated countries, so therefore you get their archives. Uh, the, uh, I read an article about it 40 years ago, if you're interested, when the records came out. But the Japanese fascists who were carrying out the most horrendous atrocities in Manchuria and North China uh, were convinced and talked to each other privately about how they were uh, carrying out a noble endeavor, trying to create an earthly paradise for the uh, people of the region uh, led by Japan's uh, generous uh, and humane uh, concern, and they had to protect them from the Chinese bandits who were trying to destroy the legitimate governments, and it was so hard, and they were suffering so much and trying to do all these wonderful things and so on. You just compare that with the actions. And, it's, uh, and you, what you find is that they're very much like us because we do exactly the same thing, for example, in the cases that I mentioned. 
And I think the mechanisms are probably about the same. And I think if we think about it, uh, we see them in our own lives. One woman who is my age and lived through the war just looked at me and she's like, you could have taught us whatever you wanted to teach us, but we pointed at each other and killed each other. And so what challenged me was, what is it that shifts perception of humanity to non-humanity? How do people completely dehumanize each other when they're neighbors? And how how do we separate this pointing fingers from what is human nature and whether it is human nature and then how to move forward within that paradox? But I, I would only say one word and then I'll suggest that you talk about it and that is that I don't think it makes a lot of sense to point fingers unless we're pointing them to ourselves. Uh, that's where we should start at least. It's very easy to criticize other people for all the terrible things they do. Uh, but anyone who's honest uh, will begin by saying, well, what am I doing? And if we look, turns out it's not so pretty. Uh, so just to take one totally different example, uh, everyone is very much exercised about the horrendous atrocities in Rwanda, right? Uh, for 100 days, uh, they were killing about 8,000 people a day, roughly, you know, maybe 800,000 people, and uh, we didn't do anything about it, and isn't that awful? Well, in fact, there's a lot more to the story. I mean, I myself was writing about those atrocities in the 1970s because they were going on, you know, not at the scale of 1994, but very serious. Something could have been done about it and something was done about it. Uh, one of the things that was done was uh, that the international institutions, uh, World Bank, IMF, and others imposed structural adjustment programs, which in fact exacerbated the conflicts. Uh, just as they had originally been almost created by Belgian and German imperialism, and then they were exacerbated by the uh, social and economic policies that were imposed, and they finally blew up to some horrendous scale. Well, you know, the problem of, in, of uh, using military force in Rwanda, or anywhere, in fact, is very tricky. Military force has unpredictable consequences. I mean, you really have to have strong reason to do it, the big heavy burden of proof to bear. But there are many things very much like it that are easy to do and that we don't do, although we know about. Like for example, right now, there is Rwanda level killing going on among just children in southern Africa every day. About 8,000 are dying from easily treatable diseases uh, with something which we could deal with, not by military intervention, but just by a few cents. You know, in rich countries, I wouldn't even notice it. Uh, but uh, we prefer not to look at that uh, because there would be a marginal inconvenience. Uh, so we therefore uh, go see Hotel Rwanda and talk about how awful they are. Uh, well, yeah, they were pretty awful, but uh, uh, we don't have to look very far to find similar things. You talk about human nature. I mean, I think actually there are, there are two sides to human nature that are uh, relevant here. One, which you your remarks point to, is we are frighteningly flexible in our abilities to draw lines around people and consider some people uh, as truly deserving within some circle and other people uh, as totally uh, outside. And uh, in case after case, governments can play on our uh, tendency, uh, our ability to do that and manipulate it, okay? Uh, but another aspect of human nature is that we can study ourselves and we can criticize our own notions and we can rise above that. And I mean, I think we see this, this, ha uh, this has happened in the history of science and that we can be optimistic that it can happen here, particularly given that the evidence shows that, that the insofar as this tendency to draw lines and segregate out 
people from each other is thought to have some rational or factual basis. Uh, the science says that that's not true, that there is no important distinction between any person on this planet and any other that merits the kinds of uh, distinctions that have been drawn and the conflicts that, that they've led to. So it's the other side of human nature that can uh, uh, examine these quest uh, questions and, uh, critically uh, that I hope we can rely on uh, to address this problem. We'll have to end sharply at 6 because of other commitments after the event. We'll take one more, one last question. Hi, I'm Professor Chomsky. Um, my question to you, it's not a, it's a question that I find myself faced with uh, people who particularly have a military background or are very patriotic to our country. 